Okay, in this video we are going to discuss finance for younger people. I can't tell you the number of times we have clients that are in their 50s, 60s that are saying, well, I wish you could work with or speak to my son, daughter, um, just graduated, graduated from college or just got married, they're in the 20s and so forth. And that's the challenge with investments and finance is you have to have money before somebody's actually going to talk to you. So why don't we cover some principles that are basic, but I think there's going to be a couple things that I will say that you will not be expecting. So let's use this as kind of our overall balance sheet. On the income side, you either have a W-2 wage or you have some kind of variable compensation. So W-2 you're on salary. It is what it is. You might get a, a raise each year, but you're going to make what you're going to make. On the variable side, you probably commission base or quarterly bonus, and that's good and bad. There are times where I've seen people that are on variable compensation get themselves in too much debt because they'll uh, take on a, a debt or a credit card or make a purchase thinking, well, I'll just make more money next month, and sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. There's two principles I just want to lay out there that I think are important in that will drive everything we're discussing here. And the first is ego, and the second is consistency, being consistent in what you do. Now, on the ego side, let's just be honest. When you're in college, for instance, you were uh, living in a dorm or an apartment or a fraternity house, probably not a very nice one. The car you drove was you know, probably used and uh, quite used, and you ate basically beans and franks, right? And what ends up happening is people get out of school, and they land their first job, and they go and they, they go lease a brand new car, and they rent that really nice apartment that has a gated community and a fireplace, and they're going out to dinner all the time. So if you can just keep your ego in check here and just pretend for the first year after college, just pretend that you're still going to live this way and bank, meaning save, put down five or ten or fifteen thousand dollars, you will have life as far as finances are concerned by the tail. So let's go to this side of the ledger and I want to first talk about debt management because there's two types of debt that most younger people have and that is credit card debt and they also have the student loan debt. Now credit card debt, the percentage you're paying is going to be somewhere between 12 and 18 percent. So it makes sense to pay this off as quickly as you can. Student loan debt is going to be somewhere between 4 and 6 percent and there's a there's kind of an axiom in the investment world that as far as when you're considering debt, if you can make a consistent return on what you owe in debt, then you don't have to rush to pay the debt off. So if you were able to go out and consistently get 12 and 18% returns on your investment dollars, then you wouldn't have to rush out and pay off this credit card debt. But you know what? That's just simply not realistic. On student loans, you could probably get 4 to 6%. Uh, you're not going to get it from bonds and CDs in the bank. You're going to have to go on something that's a little more uh, aggressive and, and volatile. But this is a manageable percentage rate. So obviously, you need to honor the payment each month. But I don't know if it's necessarily a good idea to pay extra each month in order to pay this down faster when we can be using the dollars for something else. And speaking of credit, let's go ahead and discuss a little bit some common mistakes I see uh, in your credit score. So when you look at your FICO scores, how the lenders evaluate you, 35%, 35% of your FICO score is weighted on your payment history. How quickly you pay off and, and make your payments, whether it's a credit card or your utility payment, phone payment, so forth. 30% of your score is compromised of your total debt owed. And then the numbers start getting smaller after that. 15% is, is the length of your credit history, which you really can't do anything about, but just put your time in, right? 
10% is your new credit and evaluation of your new credit as it affects your overall ratios. And then the last 10% is the type of credit, credit card, student loan, mortgage, revolving debt, so forth. But also where this is important is the number of cards you have. And I think there's a lot of misinformation about the number of cards. Some people, you'll, you'll read online that, that three is the optimum number of cards or seven is the optimum number. And it's really not that as it is your debt to credit ratio. It's a ratio that's the most important. And whether you have three cards or 10 cards, this ratio is what's important. So let's just go through some math and it'll help you understand. Let's say your, your overall credit availability is $1,000. And let's say you have $500 uh, of debt on a credit card. Well, that's 50%. Okay, That's your debt to credit ratio. If we were to go out and let's say you were able to get another credit card with a credit line of $2,000, so your total credit availability is 3,000, as long as you don't go and, <laughs> and run this up, but if you keep it at 500, 500 as a ratio of 3,000 is 16%, okay? So whether you go get a new card or maybe you take your existing card and ask for an increase, by doing that, you can reduce this ratio. Now. Anything greater than 20% month to month on your debt to credit ratio starts hurting your credit score. So whether you have three cards or 10 cards, your overall debt to credit ratio, you need to try to keep it at 20% or below. Before we leave this, uh, I'll just say one other thing that I see a, a, a typical mistake, let, on, and this is the type of credit and the number of credit cards, is let's say you have a Visa and let's say you have a MasterCard and maybe an American Express and you're going to a department store and Macy's has a, a, a great um, outfit you want or a suit that you want, and they'll knock 25% off if you buy, apply, get approved, and purchase this on that Macy's card. And I see people go ahead and do that and think, wow, I'm saving 25%. That's a smart thing. Well, it's smart if you can overall afford this, but number number one. and But number two, I've seen people, they'll They'll get the new credit card, get the discount, and then a month or two later, pay it off and then cancel the card. Folks, you never, ever cancel any type of credit that you have. Always keep it on. You can have, you can carry a zero balance, right? That doesn't mean you have to use it, but by keeping this card here, and not canceling it. Number one, it helps you with the ratios we already talked about, but it also helps you here in this length of credit history. If you keep opening and closing, you're damaging this length of credit history. Okay, so let's jump up here and talk about something I think that is very important when you look at your overall expense and how you're spending your money. Most of you watching this video, you're, you're renting where you live. And let's just say you're paying $1,500 a month in rent. So that is $18,000 that's going out every year that you'll never see again. So as far as savings goals, short term and long term, you need to save money to get yourself into a home as quickly as possible so you can convert this rent into something that starts building you savings and equity inside your home. Now the challenge is how your short-term saving goal gets integrated with your long-term saving goal. And I, and I think I'm gonna shock some people when I discuss this. If you, for a long-term saving goal, this is what we're talking about for retirement, and most of you work for a company that has a 401k. Now, a 401k is something you use for retirement. You're not gonna be able to touch the money until you're 59 and a half. But for every dollar you put in, it's a tax deduction. So let's go through and let's say you make $50,000 salary and you put $2,000 into your 401k. Your reportable income at tax time is as if you only made $48,000, right? You, you got this deduction of $2,000. Now, here's where I think what I'm going to say is controversial. 
I believe that you should have this as a priority versus this. Now, there are a couple of exceptions, and but let me let's go through the two different scenarios where it could be an exception. First of all, this two thousand dollars that you got a deduction, two thousand times. I'm just going to use a, a tax bracket of twenty five percent for federal and state. Let's say the twenty five percent on two thousand. That's five hundred dollars. If you can convince me that at tax time you're going to take this five hundred dollars savings and put it toward home or some other type of investment and savings program, then that justifies you putting this money away. The short-term goal is to reduce this expense load as fast as you can. You're going to have plenty of time in your mid-30s and beyond to save and pile money up in a 401k. And believe me, I'm, I'm a math guy. I get the whole numbers concept of small amounts of money over long periods of time, build these massive piles of money for your retirement. I get that. But you'll have plenty of time to do that. You need to get rid of this anchor in your life, right? Most people don't even know the math works like this is $500. And this $500 is just absorbed into re regular living expenses. So if you can convince me that you're going to take the $500 and you're going to you know, save it and put it towards home. Okay. That's one exception. The other exception is, is if your employer does some kind of match, right? It's free money. So if they match, um, for every dollar you put in, they match, uh, up to $3, then you go up to the match, but in your young years, you get the match and that's it. So if you're able to, I'll just keep the math simple. Let's say you're able to put away 8% of your salary toward your 401k, but they're only going to match, 4% of it, then you only put in 4%. Do not put this extra four. Take that extra four and pile it into saving for a home. Like I say, you'll have plenty of time to catch up in your 30s, 40s, 50s, in which are higher income earning years anyway. So just let me touch on the consistency part here. Look, when you get your check, when you get your check, here's the order, right? You pay yourself first. Meaning you write a check to savings first and then you pay your bills. Now, if you say, well, wait a minute, I, I can't even, I can't pay myself because I can't, I, I won't have enough money for bills. Well, you know what that means? That means your expenses are too high and which gets back to the ego thing. You need to adjust that. All right. So hopefully this was helpful to you uh, to have somebody kind of lay this out and shoot straight with you on a couple issues. Now, you can subscribe to this channel. You can go to the brinkmanacademy.com and see all of our other videos. But this has been fun for me to walk through. It's not what I normally do, uh, but hopefully uh, you, you uh, glean some good information. Okay, thanks for watching.